Now we come on to the 36th study presentation of our camp time together for this year. And this is the 2.30 study period on uh, Sabbath afternoon. The last Sabbath of our time spent together here in Canada for this year. Study number 36, 2.30 on Sabbath afternoon. I want now to come back to continue the wonderful story of Christ's penetration of the prejudice in Samaria at the city of Sychem. And we learnt in our last study period that this woman at the well had tended to humanize or look at Christ's words in a very earthly manner rather than to see in them the real spiritual significance of what he was promising to her. And naturally, of course, to her, the escape from the daily trudge up to the well to draw water and take it back to her home was a very welcome prospect. <clears throat> the... Um, in those days, of course, there's no such thing as water laid on as we have it today, and uh, drawing water was a difficult thing. It reminds me of uh, my visit to Kenya several years ago, and um, they were very diligent in making sure I had a hot bath uh, every night, and I was quite happy, happy about that until I realised or discovered what tremendous effort was involved in getting that water. And I decided to... Um, my interest was activated and I decided to uh, learn where the water came from and the daughter of Pastor Buka would take this um, four gallon container but well it was four imperial gallons which is what your gallons up here in Canada or five American gallons and that weighs of course quite a bit of uh, weight doesn't it? I think um, how many pounds to a gallon is it 10 pounds to a gallon? It's about 40 pounds. About 40 pounds altogether. Well, I followed her and she walked for about a quarter of a mile all downhill and quite steep downhill until she reached a place where a stream was flowing out of the mountainside in kind of a spring style and then she filled that uh, 40 pound water load, hoisted onto her head, not to her onto her head, way up here, and then she walked up that mountain again never, without resting. It would have killed me to try and do it. <laughs> and... Um, I wish I'd taken some pictures of it, but I just uh, didn't take the cam camera down with me that day. But when I think of the woman at the well, my mind goes back to that girl in Kenya. She was probably about 17 or 18 years of age, strong as could be, and uh, several times a day she made this trip down there to uh, haul water up there for the household needs, including my bath. Well, I wasn't... Uh, I didn't take baths so frequently after that. <laughs> I felt sorry for her. <laughs> And I can appreciate how the woman, woman of Sychar would welcome the prospect of not having to carry water every day from the well back to the house again. I'm not sure which way the, the hill went, whether it was up to the well or down to the well. Probably, probably down to the well and back up the hill with the heavy load. That's the way life usually goes, isn't it? Yeah. I remember <laughs> when I was a coal porter in New South Wales many years ago, we had to pedal a, a bicycle from... from um, to Port Kembla, what was the place? Wollongong we'll to Port Kembla. And every morning the wind was now faces going and every night the wind was now faces coming home again. <laughs> that was a strong wind too. So I'm quite sure that she found that life being very normal, she pulled, she pulled the load uphill and went down empty. Now, as I said before, the time came when Christ had to bring home to this woman's mind a real sense of her great need. And that meant, of course, exposing her sinfulness to her or giving to her a picture of her sinfulness and so we find as um, recorded in verse 16 of John the fourth chapter that Jesus said to her go call thy husband and come hither the woman answered and said I have no husband Jesus, Jesus said unto her thou hast well said I have no husband for thou hast had five husbands and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that thou saidst truly. Now, of course, when this revelation came to her, it uh, brought to her an unwelcome revelation of herself. It brought to her something that she desired not to have awakened or brought into the light. And as Sister White says on page 187, the very last two lines, the list that trembled, a mysterious hand was turning the pages of her life history, bringing to view that which she had hoped to keep forever hidden. 
who was he that could read the secrets of her life that came to her thoughts of eternity of the future judgment when all that is now hidden shall be revealed in its light conscience was awakened now does this not remind us of the scene in the temple course when Jesus Christ looked at those money, money changers and buyers and sellers and they felt as if they were rain before the final judgment scene remember that picture and of course they ran from the unwelcome sight and this woman likewise in a certain sense was running from the unwelcome unwelcome revelation to her and this is a very common tendency on the part of people we, we don't like the truth about ourselves we like to think of ourselves in the best possible light and to look upon others as being less than we are and remember Nicodemus likewise had the same problem he deplored the iniquity in Israel he longed for change in others but what about himself he didn't see any need for change there he was holy and righteous in his own eyes and trembled at the thought of a kingdom too pure for him to to participate in in his present state and so we read on page 188 she could deny nothing but she tried to evade all mention of a subject so unwelcome with deep reverence she said sir I perceive that thou art a prophet then hoping to silence conviction she turned to points of religious controversy if this was a prophet surely he could give her instruction concerning th these matters which had so long which had been so long disputed now she then ran off on a long discussion in regard to the very, the uh, merits of Jerusalem versus um, was it Shechem or Mount Gerasim anyway Mount Gerasim where the temple was uh, located a temple was located in the land of Samaria and of course the Samaritans regarded that as the place where God was to be found whereas the Jews were quite certain that God was found only in Jerusalem now which of them was right? neither, neither is, the, is the correct answer neither was right as Christ made it very clear in his answer to her when he said that neither here nor in Jerusalem but the time has come when men will worship God in spirit and in truth let's read those words now well, we'll come to them in, in a moment or two in the book Desire of Ages and we now read that patiently Jesus permitted her to lead the conversation whether she would meanwhile he watched for the opportunity to again of again bringing the truth home to her heart our fathers worshipped in this mountain she said and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship just in sight was Mount Gerizim his temple was demolished and only the altar remained the place of worship, worship had been the subject of contention between the Jews and the Samaritans some of the ancestors of the latter people had once belonged to Israel but because of their sins the Lord suffered them to be overcome by an idolatrous nation for many generations they were intermingled with idolaters whose religion gradually contaminated their own it is true that they held that their idols were only to remind them of the living God the ruler of the universe nevertheless the people were led to reverence their graven images when the temple at Jerusalem was rebuilt in the days of Ezra the Samaritans wished to join the Jews in its erection this privilege was refused them and a bitter animosity sprang up between the two peoples the Samaritans built a rival temple on Mount Gerizim here they worshipped in accordance with the Mosaic ritual though they did not wholly renounce idolatry but disasters attended them their temple was destroyed by their enemies and they seemed to be under a curse yet they still clung to their traditions and their forms of worship they would not acknowledge the temple of Jerusalem as the house of God nor admit that the religion of the Jews was superior to their own it's always a very sad thing of course that when men do something and um, it's met only with disaster and failure they still cling to their conviction that this is the work of God regardless of what's happened when they saw the religious prosperity of the Jews and the fact that the temple down there survived and theirs didn't they still, did, they still did not lead them to renounce their idolatry and join again with the Jewish nation in their worship of the true God <coughs> and in his reply a very significant reply Jesus Christ was bending her mind back to the real point of issue and that was his concern for, for her own soul's salvation and in false religion men of course argue doctrine and theology they're concerned about this uh, idea and that idea this fact or the other truth or error as the case may be 
And um, in false theology, men join the church because they agree with the doctrines taught. And, of course, naturally, we wouldn't be here if we didn't agree with each other either, so far as what is being taught. But from the very beginning of this movement, where has the emphasis always been? On a whole string of doctrines and truths, or on a practical religion which changes the heart and makes a person new? And that was Christ's concern for this woman. She could argue back and forth about the merits of Jerusalem versus um, Mount Gerizim, but he was out to capture her heart for the gospel and to introduce into her the miracle working power of the Spirit of God so that she would become a transformed, born-again Christian. That was the objective. Unless she became changed in herself, Christ would then regard his work for her as being a failure. And so even in his answer to her in regard to the various merits of Jerusalem versus Mount Gerizim, he was still coming to that point. Now let's note very carefully what he had to say. And the answer is given in verse 21 of John the fourth chapter. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor, at, nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you worship, you know, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth for the Spirit seeketh such, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. <clears throat> now, when Christ said that the hour cometh when you shall neither worship in Jerusalem nor in this mountain Christ recognized of course that the day of the day when the Jewish nation would any longer be the custodians of God's truth or the channel of communication of the perishing world was soon to pass away forever he understood the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 which gave 490 years to Israel's continuation after which of course the nation would cease to be God's people because of their continued apostasy and rejection of the living truth of God and he said to her it's not a matter of geographical location that counts you don't have to go to Jerusalem in order to worship God you don't have to go to Mount Gerizim to worship God what God wants is a person who has in himself the spirit of truth and will worship God in spirit and in truth that's the kind of worship that God is looking for and of course we can be very grateful today that geography is not the deciding factor as to where and how you, you shall worship the God of heaven. The deciding factor is the presence within the person that they link with God. When the life of God is in the person, then uh, that life in the person of course finds a natural communion with God and there is a response between the one and the other and that is what God is looking for, the link of fellowship or the response to his voice found in the true sheep. <clears throat> now, in return, the woman now, of course, still trying to um, keep the question away from her own personal needs, she replied, as you read there in verse 25, The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, but when he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus, Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Right, let's now move down to the end of page 189. As the woman talked with Jesus, she was impressed with his words. Never had she heard such sentiments from the priests of her own people or from the Jews. As the past of her life had been spread out before her, she had been made sensible of her great wants. Well, it says want here I know it should say I mean what need is probably a stronger word it does say want in the book she realised her soul thirst which the waters of the well of Psycho could never satisfy nothing that had hitherto come in contact with her so awakened her to a higher need Jesus had convinced her that he read the secrets of her life yet she felt that he was a friend pitying and loving her while the very purity of his presence condemned her sin, he had spoken no word of denunciation, but had told her of his grace that could renew the soul. She began to have some conviction of his character. The question arose in her mind, might this not be the long-looked-for Messiah? 
She said to him, I know the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, when, and when he has come, he will tell us all things. Jesus answered, I that speak unto thee am he. Now, during the week, we have noticed a relationship between the developing moments and the person's experience. And we have seen that the, the first thing that God works to do is to bring to a person a conviction of his need. And well, I should put first, before the conviction of his need, I should, I should really put a revelation of himself first. And that's really number two. And number one, um, I'll just use a shorter word, a picture, which otherwise we call a revelation of one's self. That's the first thing that God has to do. And when that picture of oneself is, is portrayed before the person, they are either going to be convicted by it or they're going to reject it. Now, this woman at the well did at first attempt a rejection of the revelation given to her. She turned the conversation into a new direction. She tried very hard to escape the conviction that Christ was bringing upon her. But there's something so drawing and so wonderful about the love of Jesus that even though she felt convicted, at the same time she didn't feel condemned. And um, she, she still felt that Jesus, Jesus was very, very much her friend. Now, of course, there's a great difference between Satan, the accuser of the brethren, and his work against the soul, and the work of Jesus Christ as the Saviour, and his work for the human soul. Now, when Satan, in the last days, and at any time for that matter, recalls before our minds the sins which we have committed, of which, of course, is a very, very accurate memory, then what is the purpose of that recall when made by Satan? It is to condemn and to discourage us and to separate us from God. And we feel and will feel when Satan does this that an enemy is working against us. And it will be the truth too. He will be working against us. And I found this very, very important that we never listen to that kind of voice because Satan comes against us with one purpose, that is to destroy us. And we should therefore not enter into any kind of conversation with him. I tell folk that when Satan does come with his accusations to simply say, look, old devil, you and I are not on speaking terms. We don't talk to each other. So therefore... If you desire to make a case out of my past sins, go and talk to Jesus because I've given all those sins to him. He's got them, so go and talk to him about them. And you will find, as I certainly have found too, that when you resist the devil in that way, the Bible promise is fulfilled, he will flee from you. But the moment you start to shiver and tremble and start to think about these sins and start to worry about them, then of course Satan's got his foot on the door. The next thing you know, he's inside the house. When that happens, then you'll be the victim of great discouragement. That test, uh, resist the devil and he shall flee from him. Is that James? No, I think it's from Peter, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure the exact reference. I'll give it to you after the study if you like. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's from Peter. Does anyone quickly know where the uh, scripture which says, Resist the devil and he will flee from you? Yeah, James, James 4, verse 7. Yeah. I think it is in James. Yeah. Right, you were right. It is in James. James 4, verse 7. Thank you very much. Now then, but come back and look at the difference with this, uh, with this woman when Christ spoke to her. I appreciate the, uh, the fact very much it says, Jesus had convinced to her that he read the secrets of her life, yet she felt that he was a friend pitying and loving her. While the very purity of his presence condemned her sin, he had spoken no word of denunciation, but had told her of his grace that could renew the soul. She began to have some conviction of his character. Now there, of course, is the revelation again of a holy life which does not hurt nor destroy, but only reveals in order to bring salvation. Now then, the third thing, once, once the Lord had revealed to her a picture of herself and therefore a picture of her great need and had brought conviction to her of her own sinfulness, then what was the next thing? A revelation of his power revelation of his power which of course was a revelation of himself when he said I am the Messiah or the saviour of the world let's now um, read uh, again at the end of the first paragraph on page 190 
The, the woman said the, the third last line, or the, the the third line on the page. She said to him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus answered, I that speak unto thee am he. Now, this was not, on Christ's part, a mere announcement of himself as a person. This was a revelation to that needy soul of saving power. And as she saw or gained the vision of that power, we then read, As the woman heard these words, faith sprang up in her heart. She accepted the wonderful announcement from the lips of a divine teacher. Now, faith comes by hearing, you're told in Romans 10 verse 17, and hearing by the word of God. And if you let your mind go back to the lesson we had earlier in the week when Christ was in Cana, and there came to him the nobleman from Capernaum, remember? And that man came, of course, with a faith at first, which was born only from other people's reports about Jesus Christ. And she, she, she need, he needed to develop a faith based upon his own contact and experience with the Saviour. And so it was that when Jesus said to him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And saying those words, he laid open before that man a real picture of himself and brought conviction to that man's heart. And the very next thing was that that man then came to know for himself that he was in the presence of one who could do anything, to whom all things were possible. And then the next thing, of course, was as his faith, as faith then arose, and let's put down number, point number four. You see, here we have a picture of, number one is what God does. He gave to that person a picture of herself, and conviction was the response. Then he gave revelation of his power, and what's the next response? Faith. All right? Faith is the next response. And, of course, the next response will naturally be a reaching out to lay hold upon the gift of God and the result would be cleansing and conversion. And we find all these wonderful things happening in this woman's experience. Now, again on page 119, this woman was in the appreciative state of mind. She was ready to receive the noblest revelation for she was interested in the scriptures and the Holy Spirit had been preparing her mind to receive more light. She has stated the Old Testament promise, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of, thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him you shall hearken. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 15. She longed to understand this prophecy. Light was already flashing into her mind. The water of life, the spiritual life which Christ gives to, to every thirsty soul had begun to spring up in her heart. The Spirit of the Lord was working with her. So the, the transformation, of course, was being made in that woman. And as we can put down in our next point, faith. And faith was followed by healing. And of course, in her case, it was not physical, it was spiritual, because she was not in any particular physical need of restoration. She wasn't a leper, she wasn't lame or blind, but she certainly needed spiritual restoration, and that's what God gave to her at this point of time. Now, if Christ that day had done nothing more than accomplish her conversion, that would have been an astonishing miracle of, uh, of his. But now, of course, the woman becomes the messenger to carry the good news to her countrymen in the city of Sychar. Now, at first glance, of course, we say that she would be the most unlikely candidate to be such a messenger. Now, for instance, if... Um, We've talked before about the matter of uh, appointing or selecting workers in the cause of God. We are now established upon the principle that only God in heaven above can make such appointments because he, through Jesus Christ, is the head of the church. And as uh, we're admonished in Matthew chapter 9, verses 38, and uh, Matthew chapter 9, yeah, I think it's 9, in the last two verses in the chapter 38 and 39, that when we see the harvest field or, or white and red to harvest 9 is correct 37 38 and the text says then said he to his disciples the harvest truly is plenteous but the laborers are few now what do we do when we have that kind of problem a large harvest and very few laborers do we then begin to appoint workers no the answer is found in verse 38 pray you therefore the lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest 
So our task then is to ask God to do his own work of sending forth those laborers and we then respect his choice in this matter. Now the facts are of course that when we consider some of the men uh, and women for that matter too that God had God chosen and sent, they would have been the very last people that we would have chosen. Imagine for instance if um, God has said to the church, I want you to choose a messenger of the Gentiles, would they have chosen the persecutor Paul to be that apostle? The very last possible choice, right? Yet those, he who the men would have regarded as being the very last choice, God made it as his very first choice. Now, would you, would you, um, or would you or I have selected this woman, woman of Sychar to be the messenger to the men in the city? No way because she was a woman of ill repute. She was a woman who had five husbands and now she was living with a man who was not her husband and um, because of the um, disreputable nature of her living, the people of that city would say, well, <laughs> can any good thing come out of this woman? We certainly have no confidence of what she might teach us and would have rejected her, her message out of hand. But when that woman appeared amongst them, transformed by the grace of Christ <clears throat> when they saw the new look of life upon her face the new sound of conviction in her voice they saw a transformed person no longer a no longer a woman of shame but now a woman that was enthusiastic about the wonderful message God had given to her she proved to be the very best missionary that, that the town could possibly have had because he who sinks the lowest and is transformed by the grace of Christ demonstrates the most marked results, don't they? Right? And um, in, in the kingdom of God, the ones who stand nearest in are those being plucked, who have, who have uh, been really bad sinners, but being plucked as branches from the burning have, have been transformed from the lowest to the highest, and the witness of their lives is therefore more powerful than if they had been good people and simply then embraced the message of Christianity. And so um, we move on to page 191. Of course the apostles came back in their errand amazed to find Christ speaking with a Samaritan woman. And um, now we find on page 191, the woman had been filled with joy as she listened to Christ's words. The wonderful revelation was almost... <clears throat> overpowering leaving her water pot she returned to the city to carry the message to others Jesus knew why she had gone leaving her water pot spoke unmistakably as to the effect of his words it was the, it was the earnest desire of her soul to obtain the, the living water and she forgot her errand to the well she forgot the Saviour's thirst which she had purpose to supply with heart overflowing with gladness she hastened upon her way to impart to others the precious light that she had received come she said see a man which told me all things that ever I did she said to the men of the city is not this the Christ her words touched their hearts <clears throat> there was a new expression on her face a change in her whole appearance they were interested to see Jesus, then they went out of the city and came unto him. Now of course what had happened was that she had become a living light to draw others to the Saviour. If we think in terms like this, we will put um, God the Father as the source of all light and from him flowed a stream of life into Jesus Christ day by day and that life flowed out of him into the woman there at the well, the spiritual life we're talking about of course, and now she in turn became a channel of light to the men of the city and they listened to her because of the power which was now in her because they, they saw the power had worked upon her and they recognized the difference in her as she stood there before them with such confidence and assurance and conviction proclaiming the merits of the Messiah whom she had discovered <coughs> now the result was, of course, that the men of the city came out to hear the Saviour and he remained there for quite some days. He didn't hasten north as quickly as he might otherwise have done. And there was a very wonderful harvest of souls resulting from the ministry of Christ in that place. Now this story demonstrates, demonstrates to us the power of a holy life. 
There's no doubt about the fact that Jesus Christ did not go there on his own plan making. There had been a problem developed then in Judea, as we saw in our last uh, study period or so, when the disciples of John began to call with those of Jesus about the merits of baptism, and Christ had obviously given God the problem, and God had directed him to move north to Galilee to escape any bad repercussions. And um, so they had come in the course of this journey to Samaria. And then it was that God working through Jesus Christ brought to this woman at the well this very, very wonderful conviction of truth. Now let's just run back for a moment again to the statement I read this morning, which I think we should apply at this point, page 181, page 181, it says, so would the followers of Christ, um, if we go back to the previous page and read the last four lines, page 180, to him it is declared, thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity, therefore God, even thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. The Father giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him, so with the followers of Christ. We can receive of heaven's light only as we are willing to be emptied of self. Now let's rewrite this sentence because we understand what em being emptied of self involves. We can receive of heaven's light only as we are willing to be dethroned from the position of plan maker and to accept God in that position. We, can, we cannot discern the character of God or accept Christ by faith unless we consent to, to the bringing into captivity of every thought to the obedience of Christ. In other words, again, of coming to that place where God alone is our plan maker, where we ask only two questions, what are my orders and what are the promises? And knowing these, we obey the one and trust the other. Now, when the Lord revealed to us during this week the simple principle of what holiness is, namely obedience and faith. And when we ask those two questions and nothing else but those two questions, live by those two questions and their answers day by day, then the promise is to that kind of person, to all who do this, the Holy Spirit is given without measure. Now let's put all these facts together uh, today. Now here, here is the first fact. The the period when the latter rain should be outpoured is drawing very, very close, right? And when the latter rain is poured out, the Spirit should be given to every one of us without measure, right? Now, before that time comes, we have to meet the conditions by which God is, is set free to give us that blessing without measure. And what are those conditions? They're laid out first in this paragraph, are they not? And they are the total emptying of self, they are, in short, the bring into captivity of every thought to the, to the obedience of Christ. In other words, it is faith and obedience which, of course, is the building of the Philadelphian church. Now, can you begin to appreciate then how totally appropriate and how perfect, in fact, the message has been as a, as a preparatory work for the coming endowment of God's folk with the Spirit without measure? Isn't this the very exact thing we needed to hear? Right, the exact message we needed to hear and I appreciate the fact of course that I didn't design such a message or plan to give it it's something that God has given to us as the required syllabus for our camp meeting for 1983 <clears throat> now let's come back now to a little more in regard to the woman at the well um, page 192 in the words spoken to the woman at the well, good seed had been sown, how quickly, quickly the harvest was received. The Samaritans came and heard Jesus and believed on him. Crowding about him at the well, they plied him with questions and eagerly received his explanations of many things which had been obscure to them. As they listened, their perplexities began to clear away. They were like a people in great darkness, tracing up a sudden ray of light till they had found the day but they were not satisfied with, with, this, with this short conference. They were anxious to hear more and to have their friends also listen to this wonderful teacher. They, invite, they invited him to, the, to their city and begged him to remain with them. For two days he tarried in Samaria and many more believed on him. 
Now this illustration which says here, they were like a people in great darkness, tracing by a sudden ray of light till they found the day. When I was in Botswana in Africa about four or five years ago, I was staying with a friend there in the Adventist church, and he said to me, there's some interesting caves not far from here, we'd like to go and explore them. Well, I've never been very much of a speleologist, but I thought I might go along with him and have a look around these caves. So we had some torches with us, or flashlights as you call them, and um, we went first of all down a rather long tunnel that that sloped downwards into into this hillside, and then we branched right and then we branched left and we climbed up um, and over a hump and we began to explore around and all went well until we tried to get out again. <laughs> we just couldn't find our way out. And uh, so we established a starting point and we then began to work our, wa- work our way in various directions. One person staying at the starting point to make sure that it got back there again. As we moved out in this direction, there's tunnels everywhere, just, just an a- absolute labyrinth of tunnels. And finally, um, we went. We tried this direction several times without results, but finally we went just a little bit further and there was a tiny ray of light ahead. What a relief. <laughs> <laughs> and of course we followed up this ray of light until it led us out to the main tunnel entrance and of course we then came out and looked at the sunlight again and I, I tell you the sunlight never looked so good <laughs> as it looked at that moment. And so I can appreciate the imagery here when it talks about uh, a people suddenly finding a ray of light and following it out to the light of day. Now, prior to their seeing this ray of light, they had groped here and they groped there just as we did in that cave in Botswana, over there in Africa. And each groping in each different direction brought you nowhere, excepting, of course, to, to further uh, caves and uh, tunnels going in all different directions. And you had to watch yourself so you didn't fall down some shafts at times too. And so for quite some time we looked here and looked there without any results at all and just in just the same way as those Samaritans had groped in this and that in the other direction for a long time without coming to any conclusion or point of interest. But the arrival of Christ was a ray of sunshine or light that led them out toward the open day and how eagerly they grasped the light which God brought to them at that point of time. And of course when Christ stayed there for two days there was quite a considerable harvest of souls as a result of that ministry at that point of time. <clears throat> um, now then, as I was saying earlier, of course, this, this miracle of penetration through this prejudice and so forth was or is to us a revelation of the fruitage of a holy life. A holy life being one, a truly holy person is one to whom the Spirit of God is given without measure, Right? according to our needs from day to day. Now, we today live in a world which is case-hardened against the message of righteousness. The reason being that Satan has counterfeited the truth so successfully and caused folk to make no distinction between the real message that God has given to us and the false messages. And when folk follow out these false messages, they do not experience success or deliverance. And so they then begin to generalize and say, well, we've tried religion and it doesn't work. Well, that's true, they have tried religion and it hasn't worked. No question about that. So in their minds, all religion then is categorized in the same basket and um, they, they just say, well, they no use trying this new one. I've tried 10 already and this 11th one will get me nowhere either. And so we find that people are in a situation where they, where they where like the Samaritans, they have a very deep prejudice against religion and a very deep unbelief in religion. And no amount of argument is going to penetrate the walls of prejudice around those people any more than argument would have, would have penetrated the darkness of that woman's mind or reached into the city of Sychar and awakened the interests of the city fathers within. But when Jesus Christ came in the power of the Spirit, which power attended him because he was a holy man, in other words, an obedient man who was full of faith, who asked only two questions and lived by those two questions, what are God's orders and what are his promises, a man who strengthened his spiritual power by continual communion with God, then when Jesus Christ brought all that to bear against the walls that surrounded those people, in the short space of less than half an hour or so he'd broken in and that's incredible isn't it when you think about it he didn't, take, he didn't have to stay there for weeks and weeks and weeks and gradually made ground all in the space of a half an hour or so he had overthrown the walls of prejudice 
he entered into that fortress, had had uh, captivated their minds, and they had become willing hearers, completely forgetful of the fact that he was a Jew, completely forgetful of it. As far as they were concerned, he was one of them, and they looked to him for light and truth, and gladly accepted that truth. In fact, um, later Christ was to contrast the willing acceptance made by these Samaritans with the lingering unbelief of the Jewish people. <clears throat> now let's uh, just conclude this story in the last few minutes we've got left. We have some comments now on page 194 and um, perhaps I'll go back to page 193. The stay, of Je the stay of Jesus in Samaria was designed to be a blessing to his disciples who were still under the influence of Jewish bigotry. They felt that loyalty to their own nation required them to cherish enmity toward the Samaritans. They wondered at the conduct of Jesus. They could not refuse to follow his example and during the two days in Samaria fidelity to him kept their prejudices under control yet in heart they were unreconciled. They were slow to learn that their contempt and hatred must give place to pity and sympathy but after the Lord's ascension his lessons came back to them with a new meaning. After the outpouring of the Holy Spirit they recalled the Saviour's look his words, the respect and tenderness of his bearing toward these despised strangers. When Peter went to preach in Samaria, he brought the same spirit into his own work. When John was called to Ephesus and Smyrna, he remembered the experience at Shechem and was filled with gratitude to the divine teacher who, foreseeing the difficulties they must meet, had given them help in his own example. The Saviour is still carrying forward the same work as when he preferred the water of life when he proffered the water of life to the woman of Samaria. Those who call themselves his followers may despise and shun the outcast ones, but no circumstance of birth or nationality, no condition of life can turn away his love from the children of men. To every soul, however sinful, Jesus says, if thou hast asked of me, I would have given thee living water. And we can be very thankful today that um, the ministry of Jesus has delivered us at least largely from national and international prejudices and uh, I'm very gratified to see how people of different nationalities mingle together in various parts of the world <clears throat> and how in this movement there's no such thing as lines of demarcation laid down by national barriers. It doesn't matter whether the folk are black Africans or uh, Americans or Spanish South Americans whether they're um, Europeans, whether they're Chinese or Japanese, no matter what the colour or creed or national boundary may be, we come together and we find a brotherhood and a sisterhood, a fellowship in which we all recognise ourselves, ourselves to be members of the same family. And I must confess, just one second, I must confess that when I go to Africa and meet with those African people again, who live in very poor circumstances very often, that I find that it's, it's, it's just the same joy, the same sheer joy as meeting with you folk here in Canada or down in the United States of America or back in Australia. It's one very wonderful happy family and I'm especially gratified to see the unity which is developed amongst us and for the deep love which binds our hearts as one. And the old national prejudices no longer belong. Christ has delivered us from those things which is a marvellous deliverance when you consider how deeply those disciples were prejudiced against the Samaritans back there in the days of Christ and the woman at the well. And in the woman at the well we have a very beautiful story then of the power of a holy life, the sheer power of it. So let's cultivate holiness so that we shall have the same power as Jesus did and in life going to see some very wonderful victories and some very marvellous harvests of souls to the gospel of truth for this time. Well, once again, our time has gone, so I'll stop at this point. Did you, did you have a question? Uh, no, I'm, I'd just like to comment. I'm a little amazed at those Jews, because if I didn't find a religion that promoted brotherhood, you know, amongst all, all of mankind, I wouldn't feel I had one. <laughs> that's fair enough, true. But, and that's, <laughs> that is the truth, but back in those days, of course, their prejudice was so deep that they didn't uh, see that. Well, that was part of it, yes. That was part of it. The Pharisees uh, 
And after they came back from Babylon, they, um, they thought the only way to keep themselves secure from idolatry was to keep total separation between the men and the idolaters. Um, and consequently, you don't find idol worship in the days of Christ, as far as the Jews were concerned. They did, they did keep it out of the picture. Now then, uh, let's just journey outside and get the photograph. We'll need to have about, um, I suppose, about ten chairs for one, one row to sit on. <laughs> 